Once again, today we're focusing on missions. And for 99 years, this church has been a part of not only reaching people in this city, in this region, but around the world through missionaries, supporting them, building churches, uh, the publishing of Bibles and teaching materials, uh, Bible colleges, evangelism projects, children outreaches, schools, feeding programs, television, and much, much, much more. Our goal is to do more and more each year as God enables us to do so to reach the unreached and to share the life of Jesus with everybody that we can. Now, sometimes we need to be reminded, though, of the why reason. Everybody say why. And that's what I want to share with you for a few moments here today is about the why. You saw the big theme, uh, our, our theme back here is why missions. You know, every now and then we need to be reminded and every generation needs to be reminded of why we are doing something. The impetus behind it, the motivation of why we do what we do. So I want to share with you three, three whys this morning about missions. Three whys about fulfilling the Great Commission here and around the world. And the first, the first why is God said so. Turn to somebody and say, God said so. God said so. Now, now let me ask you, do, do you remember when you were growing, those of you that have grown up, when you were growing up, did you, did you ever have a time in your life when your mother, or your dad told you to do something and you said why and they said, yeah, they, they all read from the same book or something. I, I don't know. Because I said so. Now you wanted a, a more articulate, defined answer as to why, but they didn't want to give that or they didn't have it or they, they didn't want to spend the time. They said, because I said so. You know, there are times in our lives that we need to do what God says just because he said so. We don't have to ask why we're doing this. In fact, I, I'm convinced that there are times in my life that, that, that I, I, won't e I won't even know why until I get to heaven. And it doesn't matter. I don't have to know why as long as I know he is speaking to me to do something in my life. Now, there are three very clear commands in the word of God. It's all throughout the word, but three very clear commands in the Bible where God is telling us to share his love with the world. The first one is Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Then the memory verse that I gave you a moment ago, Mark 16, 15. And then he told them, go into all the world. Everybody say all the world. And preach the good news to everyone. And then in Acts 1, 8, one of the last things that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven on that mount, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be witnesses. That's, that's telling about Jesus. Telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, what he just defined there was concentric circles of communication. Jerusalem was where they lived. That was their hometown. Judea was their region. Samaria was another concentric circle out from there. And then he wraps it up with the ends of the earth. In other words, all, in other words, all the way around the world. So we have concentric circles of influence. And we have concentric circles of in, input as far as of, of, of addressing the needs of people here locally and around the world. About half of our missions is home missions of reaching people here in our community and around the world here in America. And then the other half is literally around the world in other countries. So those are three clear mandates from him. Let's just take a look moment at what it means for God, our heavenly father, to give us a command. Now this is kind of a sidebar teaching, but hang with me here for a second. In Romans 18, 8, 15 rather, 8, 15, we read this. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. Everybody say Abba. Abba. Now the word Abba in the Aramaic and the Greek means daddy. It, the closest translation we have is daddy. And it stands for the relationship that a child has with his or her daddy. In other words, this is the equivalent of an infant or baby or even adolescent who does nothing but receive from his or her daddy. When, when, when you're a baby, you, you, you don't have a lot of input. You're not bringing a lot to the table. You, you're taking. They're, they're, they're taking care of you. They're blessing you. They're, they're taking care of all of your needs. So Jesus gives us a prayer and outline in Matthew 6, beginning with verse 9. Some of you recognize this. Our Father in heaven. 
The, new King, the old King James says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's the King James Version. And so he begins this model prayer with, uh, with the word, term, our Father. Now the word Father here is different from the term that's translated Abba in Romans. In fact, the word Father here is the word Pater. And it reflects the relationship that a father has with a mature son or daughter. Now, when we first get saved and we commit our lives to Jesus, we are spiritual infants. If you get saved and you're 50 years old, you, you're, you're a full grown adult, but spiritually an infant. Now you don't have to stay there, but we, we we're like newborn babes. We're born again. And so we're like infants or children, but we have a choice to stay as a spiritual toddler or an adolescent, or we can grow into a more intimate knowledge of Jesus and become mature men and women and sons and daughters of God. Now you may say, what does that have to do with missions, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at another scripture, Galatians 4, 1 and 2. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, now what is an heir? I didn't say hair, I said heir. An heir is someone who inherits from somebody else. Is that right? So I am an heir to my mom and dad. My brother and I are the direct heirs to my mother and dad. And anything that they have is ours. And when they pass from this life into heaven, whatever assets they have will be divided between myself and my brother. We are heirs. Now, this says, now I say that the heir as long as he is a child, it's talking about us as Christians, as long as he or she is a child, does not differ from all at all from a slave. Now that word slave there's talking about from someone who's not an heir, someone who's not, not an heir to anything. And though he is master of all in the, the heir, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Now let's, let's take a look at that in the Amplified Version. Now, here's what it says. Now, what I mean when I talk about children and their guardians is this. As long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, even though he is the future owner and manager of all the estate. So here's what God is saying. It's saying that even though I am an owner, I'm an heir of Christ, of everything that Jesus has purchased on the cross for me, I do not have access to all of it as long as I'm a spiritual infant. Now, let me take that a little, little bit deeper here. Now, we have access to forgiveness. We have access to grace. We have access to love. We have access to all of those things as a child of God when we receive. But, but the stronger, powerful promises of God, I don't know if they're more powerful, but the, the, the deep things of the Lord, the spiritual things of the Lord, the Bible even says that if we're not faithful with unrighteous mammon, which is money, mammon is money, how, who, how can he entrust the, the, the greater things to us? Those are spiritual things. A spiritual revelation for the Word of God, the power of God, the gifts of the Spirit, the flow of the power of God. What he's saying is this. If you, as you're an infant, I'm going to bless you. I'm your daddy. I'm going to take care of you. Uh, all this mine is yours, I'm, but I'm going to manage it. I'm just not going to give you the keys to the new Ferrari. I'm, I'm going I'm to put you in the jump seat in the back. I'm going to haul you around in it, but, but I'm not going to give you the keys to it, see, because you're an infant. Now, I'm, I'm going to transition that in a minute. You know, I've got a 12-year-old granddaughter, and, uh, and I, I bought her, uh, we bought her a, a, a four-wheeler, and we bought a helmet, too. And uh, she, 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 I give her the keys to that, and she drives that four-wheeler around. She does as good with it. But now I've got two twin, 20-some month old, about 26, 27 months old now. You know what I got them? Teeny tiny tricycles that don't have a motor on it, and they can't even work the pedals yet. You know, they, they'll sit on it and me push them, but they, they can't work the pedals yet. Well, I'm not going to give them the keys to the four-wheeler. Neither am I going to give the 12-year-old the keys to my truck. Not now. Not ever. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm, 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 I'll, I'll, have to, I'll regret that remark. I know I will. But when she gets 16, what am I going to do? I'm going to do for her like I did her mama. I'm going to help her. She's help her with the car. Help her to drive, see? Is she sitting over there? Well, I don't see her anywhere. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to help her with that, see? So, but I'm not going to give it to her now. Why? Because she's adolescent. I'm not going to give those babies that because they're infants. Do I love them any less? No. 
Does everything I have still, I'm, I'm going to give to them someday? Yes, but not now. Why? Because they're not mature enough to handle it. Now, the same thing is true in the spiritual realm. When, when we, we say, you know, Daddy God, we want that intimacy. He's our Daddy God. But, but as our Father God, He will entrust to us as we grow up in Him, as we hide the Word in our hearts. That's why it's so important to read the Bible, get the Word of God on the inside of you, learn about the things of God. Even like Paul said, follow me as I follow Jesus, to grow up in all those things. Ephesians talks about maturing, that we're to mature in the things of God. We don't stay infants. So as we mature, God can give us more things, but also God can give us more responsibility. And, and that's why he saved us, not just so we could sit at the table and eat uh, baby food all the time and throw crackers in the floor. But we can be at a place in our lives. Are y'all getting any of this? We can be a place in our lives where we can, we can be trusted with his power, entrusted with his revelation, entrusted with the anointing of God to do greater things in the kingdom, to reveal himself to this world, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. See, the problem is not that the father doesn't want to give it to us. The problem is that we must grow up to receive it. Psalm 2.8 is an incredible verse. It says this, Psalm 2.8, only ask, only ask, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to have the title deed to every stitch of property on the planet. That's not what he's talking about. God doesn't see things like we see things. When he says, I'm going to give you the earth as a possession, he's not talking about that well, you're going to own every, every farm and every ranch and every building in Manhattan and everything else. I was in New York a few years ago and we were in, in Central Park and so this guy that was taking us around, giving us a tour, I said, have they ever appraised this thing? I'm thinking, this is worth some money right here. You could build some stuff here. Central Park, right? And he, said, he said, yes, just a, just a couple of years ago, they appraised it. I forget the number, but it, uh, what comes to my mind, I could be incorrect on this. You can Google it. was somewhere around $58 billion. Well, God's not saying, I'm going to give you the title deed to Central Park. What he's saying is, I'm, I'm going to give you this earth to possess the authority and the power to redeem mankind, to, to tell people about Jesus. I'm going to give you open doors. I'm going to give you a way you can get into every nation and every tongue and every people and communicate the gospel. That's what he's saying. I'll give you, ask and I'll give you the nations. That's what he's talking about. What he's not going to give the nations to infants. He's not going to give it there. So what is God saying? He's saying, ask big. But in order to receive big, we must grow up. Now, there's, there's still some things that I'm asking God for that I'm not too sure I'm big enough. I'm not too sure I've grown enough. I'll be honest with you. I'm not too sure I'm mature enough. I'm working on it. I'm asking Holy Spirit, where do I need to grow? How do I need to develop? In this area of my life, how do I need to develop? I'm still growing. Now, physically, I know I'm not. But, but, I, but I'm spiritually, I'm still growing. And don't, don't ever lose your desire to grow spiritually. I'm talking about missions and there's two more here, but this one is so important because if, if, we're, if we're going to carry the message as many places as we can, and remember, we can't do everything, but we can do everything we can. When I travel, man, I, nations, I think, man, I look at all these people. Every time I'm in, an, I'm in an airport, especially a large airport, it's like, look at all these people. They're going all different directions. Jesus, help us to reach all these people. Give us the nations. I speak that verse. Give us the nations, God. Give us the nations. Give us the nations. Raise up men and women in every nation. Give us the nations, God. Well, ask me. Why? Because God's a big God. Well, I'm just happy. I'm just happy that my house, we're all saved. And we don't let anybody come into our house and not save. Get out of that. Get out of your houses. God wants you to be a missionary right there where you are. Come on, reach out to people. Go get that, get that share. Go, go get your home. Don't just, don't, don't just be nice one day. Get you enough that you can be nice every day this week. That you can serve somebody every, every day, every day this week. Every day this week. I was following Rose over to Kentucky not too long ago uh, to see her dad. And I was going to spend the day and come back. And we went through a McDonald's over here in Illinois to get something to eat. And, and she was in front of me. She paid for mine. Yeah. So, so I pulled up. Of course, the lady serving, she don't know that that's my wife, you know. And she said, sir, that good looking woman paid for your, you, you might, you might want to chase her down. I said, you know what? I've been chasing her for a long time. Do something, serve somebody every day. And so, you know, one of the basic signs of maturity is obedience. It is. 
It's one of the basic signs of maturity. A child that is not obedient is not mature. But you've got a 16-year-old and you say, you come in, you're going to be at 10 o'clock and five minutes to 10, they roll in. There's some maturity there. See, there's some maturity there. See, immature says, I'm going to stretch the lines. I'm going to get by with everything I can. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, can I do this and do this and still be saved? <laughs> be it unto you according to your faith. <laughs> See, that's immaturity. What can I do to get closer to him? See, that's maturity. That's maturity. Uh, Oswald J. Smith said, no one has the right to hear the gospel twice while there remains someone who has not heard it once. Whew. And that hits me every time I read that. And I've been, in, I've been in places with people who've never heard it once. Another man said, the mark of a great church is not the seating capacity, but the sending capacity. See, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered as a command to be obeyed. Here's a second one today. Number two, people still need the Lord. They still need the Lord. They still do. Don't, don't you listen. Don't you listen to the news broadcast. I wouldn't listen to them at all about anything. But don't listen to the news broadcast. People still need the Lord. In 1984, the gospel singer and songwriter Steve Green released one of, what I believe is one of the most incredible songs ever written. Uh, especially about missions, and the title was People Need the Lord. Here's some of the lyrics. Every day they pass me by, I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries, only Jesus hears. And then the chorus, people need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize people need the Lord? And here's, I love this verse. We are called to take his light to a world where wrong seems right. What could be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost? In a recent minister's meeting of leaders around the world, leading ministers around the world, I heard one of the speakers say there are at least 3,000 languages, and these would be major languages, not just dialects. There are many more, possibly 20,000 when you include sub-dialects. 3,000 languages that do not have the Bible translated in their language group. And one of the goals of that group that I was in was to see that completed by the year 2030, finish 2030, finish the Great Commission by the year 2030, of communicating the gospel in every language group and every nation and every world and every group possible around the world. You see, people in our neighborhood need the Lord. People in your school need the Lord. People in our workplace need the Lord. People in our family need the Lord. Don't be pointing at anybody right now, but people <laughs> everywhere need the Lord. One of our partners in missions that we work with in, is Reaching a Generation based in South Africa and with a, also a base now in Zambia as well on the western side, a very heavily unreached area. I just received an email from the director, Jacques von Bommel, this past week. I'll be with him here in June. He said, excited to share with everyone some exciting news. Just received the funding to build the next Image Hope Center. Image Hope Center is, is, is a center, a building uh, with a, like a dormitory and a training center for young girls because the culture in that area is when the girls first, uh, well, when they move from adolescent and they have that transition in their body physically, uh, then they put a red flag up there in, uh, at, at, at the house, the little hut where she lives, and that means she, she's ready to be married. She could be 11 years old, she could be 12 years old, she could be 13 years old. And, and so they, but they get money for it. So they marry her off to some guy that's got five wives and he's 56 years old or whatever. And, and so, and they, and that's what they do. Or some of them are even sold into, into prostitution. And so these, these Imagine Hope Centers that we've been a part of, uh, is, is, is helps to bring those girls from that. And it helps the family financially as well to bring the girls and then train them a skill and to keep them being sold or married off for money for the family. This will be the third center, and, they along, and alongside this, we will, are planning to build a skill center for the women who are ministering to the children in the communities. We plan on teaching them pottery, leather work, sewing, woodwork, beading, jewelry making, and soap making. The center will be open on our ministry site, and we are planning on building a building similar to the Imagine Hope Centers. We are in need of training uh, 
and skills development for these incredible women in Zambia. If anyone knows people who may be able to help us in this disciplines, it will be a huge help. So if you want to go to Zambia and help, I can hook you up. We also, and it'll be an incredible ministry. We also just concluded meetings. I want you to listen to this. We also just concluded meetings with the vice president of Zambia. And the government has decided to join our efforts and in the process to help stop child marriage and empowerment for women being one of their goals. Now listen to this. When we're struggling in America to keep from killing babies when they're born, listen to this. The vice president committed to paying for the school fees of the girls in our centers as well as doing a matching grant for new Imagine Hope centers in that country. Is that incredible or what? They also have committed to get church leaders, tribal leaders, and government leaders in a room for a conference to address the needs of women and children and the roles each partner can play. And then uh, he goes on, so what, and, I, and I, just, I just say wow to that. What, what an incredible report. Now, this is the ministry that we helped to purchase a pontoon boat for the Zambezi River to go up the Zambezi. They pull up on a sandbar close to a village. Kids come down, and we have like a Sunday school, have church there for those kids and hand out. It's just incredible. Go up to the next village, pull up on a sandbar on the Zambezi. There's sandbars everywhere. And this is the, one of the most unreached people groups in the world. Can we reach everyone? No. But we can reach everyone we can, can't we? Here's the last one. The last reason why. Because we can. And we should. And we must. You know, I can preach about anything and not lose my emotions except missions. Because it's the heartbeat of God. And it should be our heartbeat. It doesn't mean that all of us have to sell everything we've got and go to a foreign country somewhere. Not something that at all. We've got people who do that for us called missionaries. But it does mean we can all be all involved in the heartbeat of missions. We've been given the good news of the kingdom. Jesus said in Luke 4, 43, I must preach the good news of the kingdom in other towns too. Just because he had a good meeting in one town, he didn't build a church and stay and retire there. He said, we must go to other towns too. He says, that is why I was sent. Last week I was in Honduras speaking at a national pastor's conference and helping with a major crusade in the capital city of Tegucigalpa. One of the key pastors came to me and he said, you know, pastor, 30 years ago, Christians made up less than 2% in Honduras. He said, today they told over 52% in the nation. Isn't that amazing? He said, here's the reason why. Here's the reason why. Missionaries and evangelism has changed our nation. I believe we're living what Bible calls the end times. I'm about through. Just hang with me here. The enemy is ramping up his efforts to stop the spread of the gospel around the world. In China, the new self-declared president, I would say dictator, has launched an all-out attack on every the ever-growing Christian church in China. I talked with my source in China just a couple of weeks ago. He said that pastors are, are being arrested by the government, uh, many times taking them and their families don't even know where they are. They can't contact them. They have no rights at all. Churches are being closed and destroyed, even what's called the Three Self Church, which is the government-sanctioned church for China. It's one they approve of. They're even shutting them down, destroying some buildings, uh, taking pastors off as well. There's an intense persecution in China and to purge the nation of Christianity. Vice President Mike Pence recently made this comment about China. The Chinese government can't stand the idea of a power to which its people owe a higher allegiance. And thus, it severely represses religious freedom. Yet as Christians, we know that we must always honor God above men. Thank God for a vice president that has a clue. And I don't want to go down a rabbit trail here, but we have the same thing happening in our nation today of people who do not honor God, who do not recognize there is a higher authority than us, that there is respect for life in this nation. We have the same thing infiltrating our government as well. And as Americans, we need to wake up 
because if we, if we, we, we bring in socialism, I've seen it's a, it's a fancy word for communism. The same thing happens here in America and I won't be able to get up here and preach like this and you won't be able to share the gospel like we're freely done. But that's not going to happen in America, praise God. In Russia, President Putin has signed into new laws that, several rest that severely restrict mass communication of the gospel with severe penalties for those who violate these laws. I'll be preaching there in September as well. He's really trying to restrict the, the growth of the church. The predominantly Hindu government of India has increased its control on and persecution of Christians. Now, India and, and, and China make up about a third or more of the world's population. And so again, using their governmental powers to enact laws to selectively restrict the preaching of the gospel. We see the same thing happening here in America. There's selective persecution in America if you haven't noticed it all yet. But in spite of all of these end time efforts to stop the message of redemption to all people, the church of the living God is growing exponentially around the world and I believe will continue to do so in a great end time revival. We can, we should, we must. There's three things we can do. We can pray, we can give, we can go, or you can do all of them. I have a little card in my hand that was in your bulletin when you came in. It's called our Faith Promise Card. And this is how we facilitate our missions giving. We make faith promises. We pray this simple prayer, Lord, what are you and I going to do about missions this year? And then we make that commitment. A faith promise is not a pledge. A pledge is based on what you and I have in a bank, what we know we can do. A faith promise is based on what we can believe God for, what we believe God wants us to do. That's what a faith promise is. And we don't make a big push. It's just, you know, we're either grown up or we're not grown up. And grown ups know what to do and make a faith promise, a commitment. Now, in our, my, my personal finances, Rose and I, we have, it's like a pie, there's slices. Part of it goes to fuel for vehicles. Part of it goes to uh, stuff for the house. Part of it goes for food. Part of it goes for in clothes, you know, just like that. There's slices of the pie. The same is true in your budget. Well, the same is true in our giving. We, are, we have a giving pie, we have tithes. That's, that belongs to God. We're just returning that to him. Then we have special offerings, you know, whether it's a speaker or we're sewing into something or, or the building program, the project going on over here. Somebody says, Pastor, you have this three and a half million dollar building expansion and all this going on. You can't ask people for money for missions because you, you need money for that. Hey, I don't need money for anything. I'm just the manager here. This, this all belongs to God. When I'm gone, it's still gonna be here. Everything's gonna be, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. And so I'm just managing it for him and I know it's World Fest time. And so in our giving, we got money for the special project over there. And then we've got another slice of the pie that's for missions. And what I've known about God, if we'll meet his needs first, if we'll do what he says first, he'll bless everything we've got, press down, good measure, running over. And I don't have to worry about the rest of the pie. See, when you eat the whole pie, you've got no seed in the ground anywhere for anything to come up in your life. And so that's what we do. And we just pray and we put that down. This is what we believe God for. And then we, we fill this out. We tear this part off here. We stick it in our Bible or put it on a magnet on the, on the refrigerator or whatever, just to remind us. And we pray over that. God, give me ideas. Give me increase, Lord. Show me how I can, how I can be a blessing, Lord, to, to do just that. How I, can, how I can be a blessing to reach people around the world. Lord, thank you for allowing me to have a job where I can give and send other people. And I don't have to sell everything I've got and learn another language and move to a different culture. Yeah, yeah, look at it that way. That's motivation. <laughs> but really, it's a hard thing. And it's a mature thing. And God entrusts the keys of the kingdom to his children that are growing. We're, we're going to close the service here today, this part of it, with, with our offering, our regular offering. But then we're going to put these things in there. And if you, if you didn't get one of these today and you want one, our ushers have got them right now. Just raise your hand and they'll get them to you right now. I, I'd like for everybody to have one. If you don't have one, raise your hand. If you don't want one, that's okay. We won't waste one on you. That's all right. But if you don't have one and you want one, raise your hand. Our ushers are getting to you. There's one over here, some over here. Just make sure everybody's got one. And then we're just going to pray this simple prayer. No, no emotional thing. We're not going to show you pictures of starving babies and stuff like that. And there's nothing wrong with that because that does open our hearts to see there is a need. There is a need. 
You know, I, I preached uh, in Honduras on Wednesday night. I flew in on Wednesday and they said, you're preaching in a local church, one of the, one of the sponsors to the crusade. I said, okay. And so I got there and uh, I was kind of, Lord, what do you want me to share with this church? And I had two or three things on my mind and the Holy Spirit just kept bringing me back to, to my life message, Dare to Dream Big. It's okay. So I got up and shared that message. And this, I'm telling you, this church, they were, they were cooking with peanut oil. I, I mean, they had screens just like us. They had flashing lights. They had women and little girls dressed up in beautiful, beautiful array and flag. They were, they were dancing and they, they had a great worship team and, and everything was concrete and the decibel level was about 242. And uh, uh, it, they, you tell them they worshiped for, for almost an hour. It was absolutely phenomenal. It was Wednesday night. There's about three or 400 people there and the church would seat more than that. And, and man, they were, they were worshiping the God. They were so excited. I'm like, wow. On a little bitty street, a metal roof, sides, concrete floors. Man, they had it going on. I thought, God, this is a result of somebody sharing the gospel. Thousands got saved that week. Somebody, because somebody gave to make that crusade work. Nothing happens for nothing. Nothing happens for nothing. So we have, as mature men and women of God, the opportunity to pray, to believe God, and to give. I want you to take that little card right now, and we're just going to join together and pray that prayer together. Some of you already came prepared today. That's okay. Some of you didn't, and you say, you know, I, I want to go home and pray about this week. I didn't, I didn't, God's touched my heart, and, and, and I, I, I've got a new vision of this. And take it home. That's okay. Bring it back next week. Put it in the offering next week. Nobody's going to call you. Nobody's going to say, we see here where you pledged. Nobody's going to call you. This just helps us with our budget. Because every week we have to say yes to something or no to something based on what we have and what we can do. And there's a lot of times we have to say no to something. I don't, want, I don't like saying no to any of that. Sometimes I'll say yes to something and the bookkeeper say, are, are you sure? <laughs> oh, I believe Jesus is. He'll take care of it. What does God want you to do? Let's pray it. Say, dear Jesus, what are you and I going to do about missions this year? Amen.